<laughs> we are Chicago Brain Buddies, Aaron Freeman, funny man, and neuroscientist, budding neuroscientist. That's a lot of me. And I am Peggy Mason, professor of neurobiology at University of Chicago. And we do Chicago Brain Buddies for the Chicago chapter of the Society for Neuroscience and the Chicago Council for Science and Technology. It's like you're like you're, you're you know you you you're wasted as a as a professor. You should be like a regular broadcaster. So, but today, we're what are talking, we talking about? Today, you know, one of the great things about science is when it proves that your friends are right. And there was a new study that came out that about a, about a new set of experiments involving pro-social behavior in rats which proved once again that Professor Peggy Mason and her groundbreaking rat neuroscientific pro-social experiments were correct. Don't you feel good? It really does. I, I, you, you work and you think you've found something, but the real proof of the pudding, the real proof that you found something is if somebody else uh, replicates what you've done. And this is our second replica, second major replication. I, I people have told me about experiments, but it really doesn't count until it gets published. So in this study, which was really a, a very nice and innovative way to use the the basic paradigm that we introduced, um, the, uh, the 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 the. Um, a group at University of Arizona, I believe, led by Stefan Tomek, um, wanted to know whether rats would value helping another rat more or less than heroin. Okay? So how would you do that experiment? How would you do that experiment, Aaron? Well, it's no fair. I know. I read the paper. I know how they did the experiment. But I mean, I, you know, but I suppose... Um, there, I've read about experiments done with rats and nicotine. I think it was nicotine, or it could have been cocaine, where rats would uh, uh, starve themselves. Uh, they would turn down food in order to get another shot of nicotine. They'd press a lever. They would give them a shot of nicotine or a shot of cocaine. And so the rats would, as they say, would, would, would uh, prefer their substance of choice to food to preserve their own lives. So I yeah. Know that. So and and the way it works is that when they press a lever, they get um, they get an injection. You know, they're they're basically mainlining this stuff, right? Right. Uh, right. It's going right into their bloodstream. Right. And so they're getting a real big hefty jolt of of yum yum, uh, <laughs> and uh, and so what they what they did in this study was they trained up the rats so that the rats. Uh, helped another rat. They taught them the peggy the trapped rat, and this this rat would would open the door so the trapped rat could get out. They replicated the Mason maneuver. So that's that's a replication. But then they went on and they put a um, a cannula in to inject the this heroin, and they trained the rat so that the rat knew a what's that cannula, a cannula, a tube. Like an IV. So they stuck a tube in the rat's head. It, yeah, but it's going in, not into the brain, but into their. So, so the animal can decide to work for, um, for the heroin. It can press the lever and get a jolt of heroin. And this is called self-administration. The now, rat is administering to itself. Now, but, it, but it wasn't heroin. just heroin. What's that? It wasn't just heroin. Th this is, so you can do it with any substance. In this case, they did it with heroin. They also yeah. did it with sucrose. Right, yeah. So they press this That's lever, important. they self-administer the drug. And then after they learn how to do that, they're put back in with the with the trapped rat. And now they have three choices. They can take the drug, they can help the rat, or they can do both. And if they if they are getting sucrose, they do both. They'll they'll get some sucrose, but they'll also 
open the door to let the trapped rat out. If they have a plugged IV, meaning they press the lever, but nothing happens, they don't press the lever and they do um, let the trapped rat out. If they have a, a, um, a, a, an IV that's administering heroin, they press the lever and don't help the rat. So the, the way that they did it was that they had the rat press only, the pr rat only had to press once and then he had to stop pressing for 20 seconds um, and then press once, stop for 20 seconds. To get, either, to get either the sucrose or the heroin. Right. Right, okay. Um, and so think... what does that tell you? It tells you that... Yeah. Go ahead. What, is, well, what, is, what tell me? What does that experiment, what does that finding tell you? What was the finding? The finding was that they would, they would do well. I mean, it showed that, uh, that when you're high, man, you know, you just want to get high and like lay back. I mean, this rescue thing is nice, man, but the inside of my eyelids has some really wild stuff going on. Well, that's, that's one interpretation. They, <laughs> they don't think that's the case. And, and they, they argue against that because in fact, when they, um, they measured all sorts of behaviors that often uh, accompany heroin intoxication, if you will. And the rats weren't showing these. Okay. So they were not they were high. lotto. They, they, were. <laughs> they just liked it and they would prefer to spend their time at the lever rather than opening the door. So it's used, I just say it's useful to remember always, I guess, that while rats are immensely useful in studying human behavior and all kinds of human things, they're not humans and their reactions are not the same as human beings. Just because the heroin might make me high, I've never actually had real heroin, but if it might make me high, that doesn't mean that it'll make a rat high. Well, no, it, that's it'll make a rat high. Uh, because, the the issue is more that the dose was low enough that it wasn't making them uh, incapable of of say um, opening the door. They were still capable. They were not blotto. Oh. And, I, and I think that they argue for that pretty convincingly. So okay, so what happens is that they in the presence of uh, the the sucrose habituated rats would retain their pro-social orientation throughout the experiment. Whereas the heroin habituated rats, not so much. Hero they're not habituated. They're, they're getting heroin or sucrose. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. So, but I mean, they, but they, but they, they, they had been getting it what for 21 days before they started. It's, the, not uh, a, it's, it's about what they get that moment. But, okay. So it, it's it's really about what they got this moment because when the, with the animals that had the plug cannula they had gotten heroin before that's what they saying, weren't yeah, getting it at that moment so it's really what about what happens at that time and Luani okay. asks you know is does this mean pleasure is a priority for the brain I'm not sure I would put it that way I think what it means is that uh, is that the motivation to get the heroin, the craving, which is really what the brain is really good at. The brain is not that great at saying, oh, let's be happy for five hours. You can't sort of maintain happiness for five hours, but you can want something for five hours. And evolutionarily speaking, that's a much more useful uh, uh, affective state to want something because it motivates the animal to go do something. So these animals want the heroin more than they want to help the trapped rat. Right. And you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because they, uh, a certain famous neuroscience who will remain nameless uh, argues that, that that ability to maintain desire for a thing for vast stretches of time is among the things that makes us most uniquely human. That humans can maintain, like, Cub fans maintain our faith that they will win the World Series for decades, despite heartbreak after heartbreak, but we were still able to have faith. And, we, and Christians believe 
in a, a world that will come long after they expect their own deaths to occur. Well, one of the hardest things for rats to do is to is to adapt to the time out. So when they press a lever, they can press the lever, but then they have to wait for 20 seconds or some number of some amount of time before the pressing the lever will do anything again. Um, and, and, and that is a very difficult thing for a rat to do. And if you give them antidepressants, they do it better. They can wait for a longer period of time. And, so and yes, they, Luani, we're talking about wanting, craving, wanting. Yes. That is, that's the whole, that's the whole point of all this affect is to drive behavior to get you off the couch, right? As I <laughs> remind me again, remind me again, who was it who posed Don the fundamental Faf. question? What is Don, Don Faf? Don Faf, why do anything? The fundamental question of neuroscience: Why do anything? Right. So, so I, I have to say that we we did a version of this experiment a long time ago. I've never published. I haven't published this yet. Um, but what we did was we had these rats that opened the door, and we put them at one side of the arena, and on the other side of the arena, we put the trapped rat, and in between, we put a corridor, and the corridor had either um, had oil in it, um, and the rats from some mechanism that I don't know how they did it, they figured out that there was there was oil in this thing and they wouldn't go close to it. They wouldn't even touch touch the oil with their whiskers or their paws. And they certainly wouldn't go across it to, to rescue the, the um, trapped rat. Then we replaced the oil with water and all the rats instantly went across. <laughs> so that told us that helping is uh worth somewhere between water and oil <laughs> which is you know which is analogous to what these individuals what this research team found which is that it's worth somewhere between sugar and heroin but also now this experiment is theoretically scalable right you could figure out how much sugar how much heroin is necessary right. so there's two ways you can do that Right as they did it in this experiment, the rat only had to press once to get the heroin. And rats will pe right. press for a hundred, they'll press 128 times easily to get heroin. Yeah. So they have, they are providing this drug for very low cost. All the rats do is once. Um, and so they could increase the cost. The other thing they could do is decrease the dose. So you press once, but instead of getting the amount that they got, they get half that or a quarter of that. And that might um, decrease their, uh, that may tr make the heroin less worthwhile and may move some of the animals towards helping instead of uh, self-administering heroin. Now, by the way, are you do you plan on writing about this on your fabulous blog, thebrainissocool.com? That would be www.thebrainissocool.com. Do you plan on doing a blog post on this? I, I really, I really would like to. And um, for all of those who are interested, I'm I'm just a very, very bad person, and <laughs> I, I am I have not been able to allow myself to to write on the blog. I very much enjoy it, but I make myself do the things I have to do before I allow myself the pleasure of writing on the blog. Right now I'm moving and, and um, doing a bunch of other things. And I just have not, uh, I, I haven't reached criteria. I haven't uh, been able to allow myself to do this. But there are other very cool posts on your wonderful blog. Yeah. Brain is so cool and I will get to it. I, okay. I, I'm determined to make my summer less crazy. Now here's, here's the thing I want to ask. Uh, as a professional, there is a big national debate and concern about opioid addiction. Right. He, th there is work to be done to build on this latest experiment, which builds on your work. It would seem that there would be, for example, energy to fund more expanded versions of the work that you've already done, and that that work could be of use in understanding the effects of addiction on social behavior. Why are you or are you pursuing NIH funding for more rat pro-social experiments? 
I, mean, I think that this is something probably that the, this research team is going to is going to do, and I think it's a very worthwhile question to pursue. Uh, in particular, there has been this idea for a long time that if you are exposed to opioids to treat an acute pain episode, that you that that your risk of addiction is very very low. We've known that for a long time. Those are what the data say. That that is what the data say. So there's there's a couple poss- there's a few possibilities for what's happening. Why um, is this opioid epidemic now all of a sudden coming into fruition? One is that even if the risk is low, the numbers are very very high. So there's a small group of people that that sneak through it at the tail. They're very extreme responders, and but there's such a huge population being treated with this stuff that um, they become addicted. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that uh, physicians are are uh, prescribing the drugs in in un, um, inappropriate times, uh, or that people are getting the drugs not through physicians uh, and getting it in other ways and becoming addicted uh, without any episode of pain. But this is the kind of question that you could very uh, easily look at in, in their model, which is if you give the, if the um, rat is trained in to get the uh, heroin uh, in the presence of an acute painful stimulus, then will they, are they less likely to prefer to to um, to to work for heroin and ignore the trapped rat? But it sounds like you're saying you are not personally interested in doing this particular experiment, even though it is very it involves an area of research, rat prosocial behavior, that you're acutely. I mean, I'm interested in doing a lot of experiments. Um, that that one's <laughs> not that's not exactly the highest on my list, and and I think this this team at in Arizona is perfectly placed to do that experiment. Okay. Um, yeah. So so uh, in our final moments here, what is our optimistic view of this particular research? I I, I think that being better than sugar is pretty good. <laughs> I, I would I would argue that there are more people that have sugar every day than have heroin every day. You know, to, to also to be uh, to clear that also, uh, who was the guy at Harvard, Michael, who did the research on whether people enjoy spending money on themselves more than they spend enjoy spending it on other people? I mean, they're, they're, yeah, and they found yeah, out that people there's enjoy quite a bit on that. There's quite a bit that you get yeah, a warm yeah. you get a warm Absolutely. glow from helping. Yeah, yeah it's, and it, and it is a warmer glow than you get from chocolate or just straight up glucose. Yeah. So then we, well, let me see. Yeah, so it was more. It kind of confirms that we are pro-social in really fundamental ways, and even even we mammals. And yeah, I think we're I think we're born to help, which is um. It's a very interesting thing. I was just reading some celebrity was saying that having kids taught her that we are not born with empathy, that you have to teach empathy. I thought, wow, how did she come to this conclusion? I I think she was she was basically saying um that you have to teach kids to share, uh, which is a slightly different thing than uh to teach them to help another in distress. Uh, yes. Right. Well, you know, there's also that very, very lovely, wonderful, wonderful work that Kylie Hamlin has done that shows that babies as young as three months old have, uh, prefer characters who help. Yeah. As you have these yeah, wonderful yeah. That we are born to help, I think, is a wonderful, wonderful takeaway from this. Well, uh, so. I, I, I just have to say that I, I just was able to um, – publish a, a chapter in this book called Think Tank that was put together by David Linden. He did a beautiful job. Uh, the other chapters are really, really interesting. So, um, and, and I called it, We Are Born to Help. There you go, there you go. 
So we are, and you certainly appear to have been born to help me because you do nothing but help my life and make me and all the richer and, and better informed and more highly amused. <laughs> Professor Peggy, Peggy Mason, the creator of Understanding the Brain, the Neuroscience of Everyday Life, the greatest MOOC in the world. And her blog is The Brain is So Cool. We'll see you next Thursday. See you next Thursday. Love you very much, Peggy. Love we love you, you everybody. We love you, everybody. Thank you. Wilton, we love Wilton. Will, we love you. Thanks Hi, Wilton. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.